Tonight, all of the day's major developing stories here on Prime. These kids are going to be traumatized for the rest of their lives. A deadly bus crash with high school students on their way to band camp on board. The bus rolling off the road, landing in an embankment. What we're learning about the horror on the highway. Plus. Bueno, realmente yo dependo básicamente de la luz. Este, mi tratamiento dura ocho o nueve horas, depende. Still dealing with darkness. Six years after Hurricane Maria, Puerto Rico still struggling with blackouts. The company that found a solution in sunlight. And let me ask you, Charlie, you once wrote about yourself. Don't worry, I don't get the hype either. <laughs> Here we are now entering season three of the show. You have over 150 million followers. Do you get the hype yet? I mean, no, <laughs> but I feel like that's the best part. Sitting down with social media's first family, the D'Amelio's dish on the latest season of their show, their relationships, and a foray into the world of fashion. Good evening, everyone. I'm Trevor Alden for Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We're following all those stories and much more, including a migrant surge at the United States border. Now the Biden administration is granting a special status to almost half a million Venezuelans already in the U.S., what that means for their eligibility to work. Plus, life in the political spotlight. Our Lindsay Davis meets throat cancer surgeon and mother of two, Aporva Ramaswamy, the wife of Republican presidential candidate Vivek Ramaswamy, as her husband campaigns for the top job. And the staggering number of Gen Zers who dream of being social media stars. Just how many have been influenced into wanting to be influencers? Our correspondents are fanned across the country covering all those stories and much more for us tonight. But we begin with a deadly bus crash roughly 75 miles north of New York City a Greyhound bus filled with high school students tumbling off the road some 40 students were headed to a band camp in Pennsylvania when that bus veered off the road down an embankment tonight we're learning at least two people are now dead more than 40 are injured and at least five students are in critical condition the crash took place in the town of Wawayanda, north and west of New York City. Traffic on Interstate 84 was stopped in both directions for hours as rescue teams pulled a ladder to the windows to try and rescue passengers. Tonight, the investigation into what exactly went wrong is just getting underway, and our Gio Benitez leads us off from near the scene. First responders today racing to the scene of this horrific charter bus crash about 70 miles northwest of New York City. Just after 1 p.m., a coach bus carrying members of a high school marching band rolling over and down an embankment along Interstate 84 in Weiwayanda, New York. While it's preliminary, it is likely that a faulty front tire contributed to the accident, although, again, this is still under investigation. Bus rollover with ejection. 84 eastbound. The bus was one of six from Farmingdale High School on Long Island heading to a band camp in Greeley, Pennsylvania. We went on a school trip and you end up on a bus on its side. Rescuers using a ladder to reach the injured and a rope to reach the crash site at the bottom of a ravine. Two adults were killed, more than 40 injured, at least five students in critical condition. Some had to be airlifted to nearby hospitals. I got chills, like, my, can't stop shaking, just worry about my friends and like a lot of my friends are in the hospital. And of course, we're thinking of all those students tonight. Gio Benitez joins us now. Gio, we heard from the governor there in that faulty front tire that may be to blame. What do we know about the bus company tonight? So, Trevor, we actually checked federal records for that company, and that company apparently had a satisfactory safety rating with just one other crash in the past two years. But that one, though, was not deadly. And now the NTSB, they are on the way, and they, of course, will investigate, Trevor. All right, Gio Benitez, thank you. Next to our nation's humanitarian crisis, the White House announcing new measures to step up deportations at the border while also providing special status to hundreds of thousands of Venezuelans. ABC's Matt Rivers is in El Paso for us. Tonight, concern and desperation growing in cities across the southern border. Officials telling ABC News preliminary numbers show Border Patrol apprehended nearly 9,000 migrants at the border Wednesday, numbers not seen since the spring. It is a national issue and it should be dealt with as a national issue and not just simply your, your border communities. 
Overnight, the Biden administration announcing 800 active duty Department of Defense personnel now deploying to the border to expand migrant holding facilities and assist in deportations. The situation is dire and for some deadly. In Eagle Pass, Texas, where 2,500 migrants crossed on Wednesday, authorities today finding the body of a man in the Rio Grande River just hours after a three-year-old boy was swept away and killed. Here in El Paso, more than a thousand migrants are crossing every day on average, some forced to sleep in the streets. Gueris Gutierrez from Venezuela is stuck. He spent all his money on a journey north he wouldn't wish on anyone. He's basically saying like, you really got to think twice before making that journey. And amid this crisis, tonight, the Biden administration easing the process for some migrants to get work permits, extending temporary protected status to more than 470,000 Venezuelans arriving in the country before July 31st, allowing them to legally work, something New York City's mayor has been pushing for for months. That announcement was uh, well received by us. Uh, we could begin the process of allowing the seekers to become job seekers, from asylum seekers to job seekers. All right, so at least some action from the government here. Matt Rivers joins us now. Matt, what are the details regarding this special status given to those Venezuelans? Yeah, Trevor, this is a major decision by the Biden administration to extend that temporary protected status to nearly half a million Venezuelans already in the country. That gives those people the legal right to both live and work in the United States for the next 18 months. Trevor. All right, Matt Rivers, thank you. And next tonight, there's a new tropical threat forming off the East Coast that could impact some areas as early as this weekend. So senior meteorologist Rob Marciano is, of course, tracking the threat. Rob, what can we expect? Well, Trevor, this thing's developing really close to the shoreline. We always worry about this because they can ramp up quickly and it doesn't give people a lot of time to prepare. But it uh, looks like it's going to become at least a tropical depression, maybe a tropical storm right now. It's, it has the potential for that. We call it a potential tropical cyclone right now. It doesn't have a center, but we think it will do that and then develop quickly and maybe to a 60 mile per hour storm. We've got tropical storm warnings that are posted from North Carolina up through Delaware, coastal flood alerts, storm surge warnings as well. This is going to have a pretty big surge, especially during the day tomorrow. The the forecast is for it to get 60 mile per hour winds and make landfall Saturday morning somewhere in North Carolina, but the effects are going to come in well before that. Look at the rain band spiral in with our computer models here during the day tomorrow. And with that heavy wet rain and wind, Wilmington up to Nags Head could have 50 plus mile per hour winds by this time tomorrow night with coastal flooding. And then look at the rain shield expand tomorrow night into Saturday morning. D.C., Baltimore, Philly, you're all getting in New Jersey up through I-95 in southern Connecticut, going to get some heavy rain. This kind of sits and spins and gets involved with the front there. So it looks to be, at the very least, a very wet and windy weekend for a very big chunk of the East Coast. Trevor? Up and down the coast. Rob Marciano for us. Rob, thank you. And next, we want to turn to the trouble on Capitol Hill as hardline Republicans have foiled Speaker Kevin McCarthy's efforts to fund the government and the military. And now a government shutdown looms just nine days away. But there's also questions about the need for additional funds for the war in Ukraine. President Biden and Zelensky are aggressively advocating for it, but some Republicans are not so sure. Here's ABC's senior national correspondent, Terry Moran. At a critical moment in the war, President Biden and First Lady Jill Biden welcoming the President and First Lady of Ukraine to the White House, publicly reaffirming their partnership. No nation can be truly secure in the world if, in fact, we don't stand up and defend the freedom of Ukraine uh, from the face of this Russian brutality and aggression. Biden promising more military aid. Significant air defense weapons, artillery ammunition, and more anti-armor systems. The price tag? Hundreds of millions of dollars. The Ukrainian leader expressed his deep gratitude, but he's also keenly aware that it's what happens up Pennsylvania Avenue at the Capitol that could decide his country's fate. I started my day in the U.S. Congress to thank his members and to people of America for all the big, huge support. I felt trust between us. But some House Republicans are drawing a hard line, refusing to budge on more money for Ukraine. 
House Speaker Kevin McCarthy had said he wanted, quote, accountability from Zelensky on how the money is being spent. Still after their meeting today, McCarthy sounding more supportive. Zelensky has answered a lot of questions for me. But the speaker is struggling to get his members on the same page. And Ukraine is just one sticking point. Today, in a stunning setback, McCarthy, for the second time, failed to muster enough Republican votes to move forward a major defense spending bill, something that typically just sails through. Uh, two people flip, so I gotta figure out how to fix that. Did you know that they were going to flip before uh, the vote? No, that wasn't uh, the impression they had given. With a fragile four-vote majority, McCarthy is at the mercy of a handful of his far-right members. This is a whole new concept of individuals that just want to burn the whole place down. It, that doesn't work. The rebel Republicans are vowing to shut down the government in just nine days if they don't get their way on a host of issues, issuing this threat to any Republicans who would break ranks. Now, if we've got some of these moderate Republicans who want to go and join up with the Democrats, they will be signing their own political death warrant and they will be handing their, it to their exec executioner. That's Terry Moran reporting. Terry, thank you. And President Biden is tonight establishing the first ever White House Office of Gun Violence Prevention. It's an office that will be overseen by Vice President Harris. And the office will have four areas of focus as they get underway, including expediting the implementation of the Safer Communities Act, figuring out what additional executive actions can be taken, better coordinating support for communities and victims already impacted by gun violence, and also expanding partnerships with states and cities working to reduce gun violence. In Hollywood tonight, it is down to the wire in the talks between the Writers Guild and the studios. And the CEOs of major media companies are now at the table trying to end the strike. Many on the picket line fear if there's no agreement this week, it could go on for months. Here's ABC's Zorin Schaub. Tonight, the nearly five-month writer's strike that brought Hollywood to a halt may be nearing an end. Representatives from the Writers Guild of America and the major studios issuing a rare joint statement. They would sit down for a second day of negotiations today. Talks yesterday have been described as very encouraging. It looks hopeful because they're talking. As long as they're talking, that's progress. More than 11,000 union writers walking off the job in May, sending shockwaves through the entertainment industry. They were soon joined by more than 160,000 sag after actors in July. All of them demanding better residual pay, higher wages for streaming shows, and protections against the rise of artificial intelligence. The labor movement around the entire country is going through the same thing. That's it. The upper levels are making millions. You have to pay your workers. And Zoreen Shah joins us now from Los Angeles. Zoreen, of course, a lot of those picket lines are still ongoing. So what are you hearing from writers about their feelings around the possibility of an impending deal here? You know, Trevor, we spoke with writers on the picket line all day long. A lot of hope, but also a lot of hesitation. Many fear if talks fall through this week, it could be months before a deal is negotiated. Trevor? A lot of people would hate to see that. Zoreen Shah for us tonight. Zoreen, thank you. The hunt is on for a convicted child sex offender who escaped custody while being treated at a St. Louis hospital. Tommy Wayne Boyd was last seen on surveillance video here walking out just before 4 this morning. He was serving 30 years in prison. Police warn he could be dangerous. And some major news in the media world. Rupert Murdoch announced today he will step down as chairman of Fox Corporation and News Corp, his sprawling media empire that includes Fox News. At 92, Murdoch has been a mogul for decades. He is no stranger to controversy, including after Donald Trump lost the 2020 election. Here's ABC's Whit Johnson. Tonight, a monumental shift in the media world. Titan Rupert Murdoch stepping down as chairman of Fox and News Corporation, which run the Wall Street Journal, the New York Post, and Fox News. We have now some personal news to share with you this morning. Our boss, Rupert Murdoch, is transitioning from... The 92-year-old writing to his staff, the time is right for me to take on different roles, announcing his son, Lachlan Murdoch, will replace him as chair effective mid-November. Rupert Murdoch spent seven decades growing his multi-billion dollar media empire. Rupert Murdoch created all of this and so much more across America and the globe. The Murdoch dynasty believed to be the inspiration in part for the hit HBO series Succession. This is not the end. I'm going to build something better.
and no stranger to controversy. Fox recently settling a bombshell defamation lawsuit topping $787 million with Dominion Voting Systems after Fox News was accused of knowingly pushing false claims about voting machines in the 2020 election. On air, then Fox News host Tucker Carlson saying, You've heard a lot over the past few days about the security of our electronic voting machines. And this is a real issue. But in a text message, Carlson called claims about Dominion shockingly reckless. He was later dropped from the network. And Laura Ingram saying this. Disturbing irregularities have been found. But off air, she said Donald Trump's attorney, Sidney Powell, who is pressing the false claims, is a bit nuts. Sorry, but she is. And Rupert Murdoch himself later calling the conspiracies about the voting systems really crazy stuff and damaging. Murdoch started out with just a small Australian newspaper expanding across continents to the UK and the US, eventually becoming a driving force in American conservative media. Each day I'm animated by a sense of purpose. And whatever I have achieved it would simply not have been possible without the love of my family. And Trevor, Rupert Murdoch, who said he was in good health, will soon become chairman emeritus. And he promised to remain engaged, watching and reading company content with a critical eye and much interest. Trevor. Our thanks to Whit Johnson. And for more now, I want to welcome in Brian Stelter, Vanity Fair special correspondent and also the author of several books, including one that's upcoming. It's called, the Net it's called Network of Lies, the epic saga of Fox News, Donald Trump, and the battle for American democracy. Brian, thanks so much for being here. That book comes out in November. It sounds like it might have a new ending now. Are you surprised by that? I am literally rewriting the ending tonight, uh, but I'm not really surprised by Rupert's announcement, and for the following reason. I spent months reading the legal filings in the Dominion v. Fox lawsuit, the one that Rupert and Laughlin settled for nearly a billion dollars in April. And through those emails and text messages, you see that Rupert Murdoch has been sort of semi-retired for a few years. You see that he's been giving up some of his power, and frankly, he was acting more like a passenger than the driver uh, when he was dealing with those 2020 election lies in the wake of uh, Trump's loss and Biden's win. So this today, this announcement, I think it confirms what has been happening for a while, which is Rupert Murdoch, no longer the swashbuckling media mogul that was feared by his rivals. He's much more now in the passenger seat and Laughlin's taking real charge. So kind of maybe this transition has been happening a little bit without it being formal for quite some time. Now, I do want your uh, reaction, Brian, to a couple of points that Rupert Murdoch made in his letter to employees announcing this decision. At one point he wrote, uh, quote, our companies are in robust health, as am I. Our opportunities, our opportunities far exceed our commercial challenges. How healthy is his empire? Uh, it has seen better days, uh, quite frankly. But Ruben Murat did a very wise thing about five years ago. He sold his movie studio and some of his other channels and assets to ABC's parent company, to Disney. That was a very well-timed deal by Rupert. It helped Disney with the streaming wars, and it moved Fox out of this really difficult marketplace for smaller media companies. Now, of course, they still own Fox News, and News Corporation still owns The Wall Street Journal and other newspapers. Some of them are, are having a, a, a strong transition to the digital age. But it's hard when you own a bunch of newspapers and a cable channel these days. It's a hard hand to be uh, holding. Those are not the best cards to play. So Lachlan Murdoch faces some challenges going forward. Now, that said, these companies do make a lot of money. They throw off a lot of cash, and they are very valuable to the Murdoch family, including all the siblings. Lachlan Murdoch has several siblings he has to worry about in the future because there will probably be a, a battle for control. But at least for now, at least with Rupert stepping aside, Lachlan is the chosen. Son. How is the reaction playing out to Lachlan being the chosen son overall between the people within the organization and outside of it? I think this was in many ways expected. Now this is confirming what has been the case for several years. But Lachlan Murdoch is still a bit of a mystery. Uh, we know through the Dominion filings he was rooting for Donald Trump to win in 2020. We know he's as, as conservative as his father. But there's been a criticism of him within the company, people saying that he's a caretaker CEO, that he's too laid back, he doesn't take charge enough. The question now is whether he's going to emerge out of his father's shadow and take command in a more public way. Uh, finally, Brian, I do want to ask, in the middle of that, that letter that Rupert Murdoch sent out to his employees. He took uh, time. It's just one sentence, but it's its own paragraph taking a swing at his competitors. And he wrote, quote, most of the media is in cahoots with the elites. 
peddling political narratives rather than pursuing the truth. Even in his farewell message, uh, he makes a point to, to say that. How does that and the fact that he chose to do that here square with his entire legacy? Well, certainly Fox News is a big part of his legacy. And Fox News peddles many narratives, not all of which are true. And that's why they've had to pay these enormous settlements. Uh, however, I think Rupert is right to point to elitism as something that has caused political turmoil and polarization. You don't get to a Donald Trump presidency and you don't get to Trump being the leading contender for the 2024 GOP nomination without many Americans feeling Rupert's similar contempt for elites. Of course, Rupert Murdoch is a bi big billionaire. He is elite in every sense of the word. But I don't think we we should totally dismiss that critique, even though he's probably hypocritical to be saying it himself. That critique is real, and it is important to study, I think. All right. Brian Stelter, looking forward to the book, and thanks for being here. Thank you. And still ahead, Alec Murdoch pleads guilty to more charges, the crimes that he is admitting to as he serves a life sentence for the murder of his wife and one of his sons. But next in our prime focus, Hurricane Maria wiped out much of Puerto Rico's crop value and residents are still struggling with blackouts. Six years later, how the community is now taking matters into their own hands. We work a lot with educating people on the necessity of producing locally and the impact that that also have in our economy. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. NBC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wiener Mobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. When Hurricane Maria hit Puerto Rico in 2017, it wiped out nearly 80% of the island's crop value while leaving a majority of the island without power. And independent researchers marked the death toll in the thousands. But six years after Maria made landfall, Boricuas left on the island continue to piece their community back together. And in tonight's prime focus, our Stephanie Ramos explains how they're now taking matters into their own hands. From enchantment, to darkness. Puerto Ricans continue to struggle with blackouts nearly six years after Hurricane Maria, a storm that left about 80% of the population without electricity. The ongoing frustrations even getting to Puerto Rico's Bad Bunny, who released a song called Apagón, or Blackout, along with a nearly 23-minute video that focuses on allegations of corruption, which have led Boricuas to take to the streets. Demanding Luma Energy, the island's power company, Keep the lights on. But one company knew years before Maria that the way out of darkness is to focus on one of the island's most precious resources, sunlight. 
Casa Pueblo is located in the town of Arjuntas and managed to keep its lights on after Hurricane Maria, becoming a community hub for people waiting weeks for the island's grid operators to restore power. Welcome to Adjunta Pueblo Solar. That's the new narrative. That's the future that we are building uh, in, in Adjuntas. The radio station, the solar cinema, and all of the infrastructure that we're running. Arturo Masordella is the executive director behind the organization. He has been empowering residents to take control of their community. In 1999, Casa Pueblo started with the first solar installation as a mean to break the fossil fuel dependency. At that time, Puerto Rico was 99% fossil fuel dependent, and that creates a lot of vulnerabilities. Some of the most vulnerable are people like Brenda, who requires dialysis treatment. Bueno, realmente yo dependo básicamente de la luz. Este mi tratamiento dura ocho o nueve horas, depende. Y pues la única manera que hay por el momento es Por medio de una máquina que use electricidad. Es la única manera, ¿verdad?, de yo poderme conectar y pues hacer mi tratamiento todos los días. Despite the earthquakes and other turmoil that impact the island, Brenda feels that alternative power options like solar panels serve a bigger purpose. Mayormente le den, ¿verdad?, énfasis a, ¿verdad?, proyectos así que, que valgan la pena y que a la larga todos nos beneficiemos, que es lo que cuenta. Y que ayudemos al planeta también, que es algo importante. We have 45 solar panels on, on, on the roof. For Arturo, people like Brenda are a prime example of Casa Pueblo's mission. Using our knowledge to address our needs and pushing forward the agenda that we think is important, we can exercise the right of self-determination at the community level. Community, which is integral for an island that has long felt left behind. In between their back and forth battle for independence, their dominance by Spain starting in the late 1400s and then cession to the US, Puerto Rico really hasn't had an opportunity to fully govern itself for centuries. Today, it's a US territory, but oftentimes many locals feel it's treated as less than. One of the main barriers to accessibility for Puerto Ricans hangs on a law from the 1920s called the Jones Act, which states goods carried between two U.S. ports by water must be carried in a U.S. flag vessel that is American built, owned, controlled and crewed. This causes the cost of basic goods to increase, a product of the chain reaction from raised transportation costs. That more than a hundred year old law causing islanders to once again take matters into their own hands. That's where Puerto Rico's farm to table movement kicks in. We work a lot with educating people on the necessity of producing locally and the impact that that also have in our economy. Meet Efren Robles. This is Amaran, he's a super grain, just like quinoa. He is the co-founder of Frutos del Guacabo. This family-owned farm aims to raise awareness on the importance of local food production. What we try to do is listen to what the chef needs and produce based on that. Since can be done here in Puerto Rico, our farm is very different than in other farms. It's very diversified. The main purpose of it is that people come and understand a little bit about what happens on a farm and how can they be a part of this local ecosystem. Frutas del Guacabo was originally a small hydroponic farm, meaning it relied on water to transfer nutrients to plants rather than soil. But now it has shifted its focus to helping increase local food independence across the island. Our biggest best-selling product is education. So as a first response, we need to produce food. He says that farming was one of the few good things to come after Hurricane Maria, which wiped out about 80% of the island's crop value, representing a $780 million loss in agricultural yields. Hurricane Maria was something that we never experienced before. People were afraid. When we got here, finally, everything was damaged, completely down, you know, the animals were in the cave up there, and I was with my family, you know, analyzing this moment. Sorry, it's been six years, but it been. So when we start walking, we see the neighbors grabbing like their clothes. 
and from all the, from all over the floor. So, oh, sorry. In that moment, we knew that we had something really big going on. And then there no communication. We didn't know what to do. So we did what well, we know what to do, start working. One hundred and seventy seven days after, I will never remember, forget that day. We decided to start producing, uh, start delivering again with whatever we have. The hydroponic was the first segment that was able to, to work. It was a, the best learning experience. Now Efren shares what he's learned with other producers on the island in hopes of creating a local independent food chain from Boricua Farm to Boricua Table. Some farmers stay with us and some other farmers have supplied to us, but they also develop into other bigger area, which is the main purpose of the of the project. Proof that Boricuas are still working to piece their island and their lives back together. If I can do my things for Puerto Rico, I would like to do it in education. I would like to make sure that it can be spread. Stephanie Ramos for us tonight. Stephanie, thank you. And we still have much more to get to. Coming up, we've been getting to know the politicians running for the Republican presidential nomination. But what about the partners beside them? Meet Apoorva Ramaswamy in our new series, Running Mates. He and I might disagree on how he says things, but when I, I get to talk to him, I have the pleasure of getting to talk to him more than anyone in the world. But next, the future for Gen Z may not include as many doctors or teachers. We're going to take a look at their dream job by the numbers. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching? Watching Saturdays on ABC News Live. What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, yeah. every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. It was the ideal marriage. Little did I know I was married to a man who had done something so horrible that it would devastate our lives forever. Teacher of the year is now charged with sex crimes. Only on Hulu. He was living a double life. The shocking story behind a number one true crime podcast. Prostitutes, escorts. He even cheated on me the week of our wedding. Betrayal, the perfect husband. He had a lot of fantasies. Now streaming only on Hulu. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This this is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to... So, what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. You 
your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love that. Me. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey, I'm David Muir. Wherever the story, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. The question, what do you want to be when you grow up, is as old as society itself. But my goodness, how times have changed. And here's a closer look by the numbers. A staggering 57% of Generation Z respondents told Morning Consult that they would become an influencer if given the chance. And it does make some sense. The oldest members of Gen Z were born in 1997, so they have really never known life without the internet or life without a smartphone. And like a lot of people, they are obsessed. 81% of Gen Zers say they actively follow influencers with TikTok, YouTube, and Instagram identified as the most popular platforms, naturally. And that includes 19-year-old queen of TikTok, Charlie D'Amelio, who will join us with her parents later in tonight's broadcast. She has spun her 151 million TikTok followers into TV, into music, fashion, and philanthropy. Or you could talk about 25-year-old Mr. Beast, his 184 million YouTube subscribers. He's basically a viral video factory. It's pushed his estimated net worth to $500 million. So what does Gen Z expect from an influencer? Well, 71% said someone who makes entertaining content. 70% say they're seeking ideas and inspiration. 61% say they're looking for advice. And influencers are gaining trust. In fact, more than 60% of Gen Z and millennials surveyed say they trust influencers. It's a 10% jump in just four years. And I don't want to sound like a curmudgeon, but just like the people who dreamed of being an astronaut, it is probably a good idea to have a backup plan. And we do have much more to get to here on Prime. The legal battle brewing between exes Sophie Turner and Joe Jonas. Why Turner's now suing the pop star. And as we said, we're chatting with the D'Amelios. They talk about internet fame, relationships, and what to expect on the new season of their show. But first, a look at our top trending stories on ABCnews.com. to be America's number one news? It takes asking the straightforward, tough questions. Do you believe that Donald Trump should ever be president again? How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? The newsmaking interviews. You said that there were six friends. One of them was sick. Yeah. Do you have future political aspirations? Going to the front line. The search for survivors. How does this war end? And getting to the heart of the story. Thank you for being here. We'll be here for the long run. ABC News, number one in the morning. The number one newscast. Number one in daytime talk. Friday nights, Sunday mornings versus the competition. And the number one streaming news. Thank you for making ABC News America's trusted, straightforward first choice. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about. The new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news.
When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes. And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Streaming free on ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Alec Murdoch pleads guilty to a crime as he's already serving a life sentence. Google Maps is at the center of a lawsuit after a deadly crash. And the new allegations from actress Sophie Turner as she files a suit against her estranged husband, Joe Jonas, over their kids. These stories and more in tonight's Rundown. Disgraced South Carolina attorney Alec Murdoch pled guilty today to financial fraud and money laundering. The charges include that he stole money from at least five clients. Plea came as Murdoch appeals convictions for killing his wife and son that had put him in prison for life. The murder trial gripped the country when the well-known Southern lawyer loved by his community and hated by others was found guilty of murdering members of his own family. The company that owns Arrowhead Bottled Water was ordered to stop using natural springs it has relied on for decades. The California State Water Resources Control Board said the company must drastically reduce the water it siphons from the San Bernardino National Forest. The process took eight years in community groups celebrating the win, claiming the company has damaged the surrounding ecosystem after diverting water from the forest for the past century. An attorney for the company said they take their role as stewards of the environment very seriously. Philip Paxson was driving home late at night from his daughter's birthday party outside Charlotte, North Carolina. His family says he was following a Google map route that led him down this road to where a bridge had washed out nine years earlier. Paxson's car flipping as it fell off the unguarded edge of the collapsed bridge, trapping him underwater where he drowned. Google saying, we have the deepest sympathies for the Paxson family. Our goal is to provide accurate routing information in maps, and we are reviewing this lawsuit. A coroner's office in Northern California released new details on the death of Euphoria star Angus Cloud. They say the actor died in July from an accidental overdose of cocaine, fentanyl, and other substances. Cloud starred as Fez, the lovable drug dealer in the hit HBO show for two seasons. Cloud was 25 years old. Sophie Turner suing her husband Joe Jonas, who filed for divorce earlier this month. In legal documents, Turner says she found out about the divorce through media reports. Now, the British actress is suing him to relocate their children to England. Court filings claim Jonas won't hand over the kids' passports. In a statement to ABC News, Jonas saying he wishes Turner would reconsider her position and his only concern is the well-being of his children. 82-year-old Edie has atrial fibrillation, or AFib. She felt absolutely fine, but that's not what her Apple Watch said. It was telling me to get help, like alert. I mean, it, it just did everything. Everything but call for help. That's where Jordan Tepper comes in. I said, I'll call you in 10 minutes to make sure you're okay. So immediately I, I hang up the phone and I call 911. Edie spent five days in the hospital and left with a brand new pacemaker. The five-time grandma is back to being herself. I cherish every minute of my life. I am so grateful to be here. 
And next tonight, our series Running Mates, where we get to know what some may call the better half of presidential candidates. We'll let you be the judge of that. We get to know who is Vivek Ramaswamy earlier this week, but tonight we meet his wife, Apoorva. She is a doctor and a mother of three. Is she in lockstep with her husband's at times controversial views? Lindsay Davis has tonight's Running Mates with Apoorva Ramaswamy. When was the first time that, and, and I'm wondering if Vivek told you or you knew he's going to want to run for president? Really just this past December. Mm. So that was when he really sat me down and said, Porva, I think this is something that I feel called to do because we look at the future for our sons and realizing what are the things that are needed for their prosperity, for their thriving, that's what limits them is the things that we can do as parents, but really on the political side. And I feel very confident that Vivek, as president, will be able to give Karthik and Arjun the society that they're gonna want when they're starting to enter high school. One where their actions are rewarded based on their merit, ba not based on any other aspect of their you know, appearance or their heritage, but really what they are able to do and give to other people and whether they are able to fulfill their responsibilities. Similarly, to be able to be proud of being Americans, that would be the biggest gift that I hope we, Vivek can provide to future generations. Well, how did you initially react when he said, I'm gonna do it? The first thing I said was, are you sure that this is the right time? You know, we are young. At that time, we had basically a six-month-old and a three-year-old, and we wow. really thought deeply about whether this was the right thing both for our family and whether Vivek, as a 37, you know, at that point he'll be 39, would be the best version of himself for this role. and. After reflecting on it, we realized that it really is now, as a young person, as someone who really has this investment in the future through our sons, that we both have the hope, but also the conviction that the future that we see of a, a, a true American revival is possible. What is it that you were able to fall in love with Vivek, that you think that the American people, if they also knew this about him, if they saw this side of him, then Americans would also fall in love with him? He is extremely genuine. There is no version of him that I see that he does not put out in his speeches or in his interviews. He is someone who loves people. He loves America. He loves life. He thinks that he's ex extremely optimistic. There is no version of the world in which we are, as a country, do not succeed. There is no world in which we do not experience that American revival that he talks about. And I think the people are, are starting to see it and it's honestly infectious. His greatest strength? <sighs> his, his joy and optimism. Biggest weakness? <sighs> his biggest weakness is the fact that he in some ways, is also his is, is one of his strengths is that he speaks freely, mm. and especially with social media and everything being what it is, sometimes things can be memed and taken out of context. He has said recently, Juneteenth is a useless holiday. Affirmative action is a cancer on our national soul. He's called the protesters peaceful on January 6. Do you guys agree on all of his passionate thoughts? Those are three very different statements, and I think they can be taken differently based on whether you say them the way they were or whether you take them in context. Uh, he also celebrated Juneteenth you know, a few months ago, and he believes very strongly that you know, celebrating the end of slavery is an important thing, but as holidays go, or any holiday for that matter, the fact that we have not taken a day off to allow people to vote, to actually engage in the democratic process, that would be the highest utility for any holiday. So it being the most recent national holiday that was instated, that is really where it comes from. Utility for us as a, dem as a country that says we believe in democracy, for us to still expect people to find time to vote, you know, in the interstices of their lives is really absurd. But do you have differences of opinions or are you kind of lockstep with like many of the, his main 
big political thrusts. He and I might disagree on how he says things, but when I, I get to talk to him, I have the pleasure of getting to talk to him more than anyone in the world. And I know in, in his heart, I agree with everything he believes. Our thanks, of course, to Lindsay Davis for that. So now let's turn to our weekly segment, Tick Talk. We're going to take a closer look at the story behind the sensation, and they are the reigning first family of social media. The D'Amelios rose to fame thanks to Charlie's viral dancing TikToks. But the family of four has come a long way since then, earning brand deals, acting gigs, stints on Dancing with the Stars. And now, season three of their Hulu reality series, The D'Amelio Show, is streaming, giving fans an inside look at their family dynamics, their romantic relationships, their business ventures. And our Will Gann sat down with Charlie and her parents, Heidi and Mark, to talk about the new season. D'Amelio family, thank you so much for joining us today. Although I did miss the all black memo. I wish <laughs> someone would have told me. Um, we didn't plan it. We did this on accident, actually. <laughs> you are the queen of TikTok. Like, y'all are the reigning first family, I feel like, of social media. This year was insane. Welcome to the Grammy. Fashion Week, Europe, Milan, Japan, Kids' Choice Awards. Let me ask you, Charlie, you once wrote about yourself, don't worry, I don't get the hype either. <laughs> Here we are now, entering season three of the show. You have over 150 million followers. Do you get the hype yet? I mean, no. <laughs> <laughs> but I feel like that's the best part. I mean, knowing that this all just happened so randomly and it wasn't you know, no one knew that it would be what it is today, and I'm so happy that we're still getting to do such amazing things all together now. Uh, ready? No, no, in three! I mean, getting slimed together on national television, I'm sure is, nothing will bring you together quicker than that, I have to imagine. Yeah. <laughs> we bonded over <clears throat> slime, for sure. I want to ask a little bit about some of your guiding principles as parents, navigating a very non-traditional parenting journey what have been some of those guiding principles for you, Mark? It's the hardest balance because you're dealing with young women who you were trying to do the best thing for them and you have to know when to push and when is it, is this just, hey, I don't want to get up for school in the morning kind of a, a moment or is this a true uh, mental health situation? And I know they're going to look back on this ride as it being incredible. And Heidi, I mean, offering advice to your girls on situations that y'all did not have to deal with as young adults, how do you navigate that? Well, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, I talk with my friends. But there are things that we just can't plan for. And there's 150 million followers. And sometimes I have those conversations with Charlie. I'm like, I don't know what you're going through. And I feel like they do a good job at, you know, making me feel proud of myself and happy with everything that I'm accomplished. But still, you know, you got to get done the stuff that you have to do around the house and and still keeping that normalcy of like you're a teenager. We got to see both of you share this Dancing with the Stars journey. What is your relationship like with dance now in a post Dancing with the Stars world? I'm not doing too much but I, I have a dance room in my garage that I use to just work out or if I want to get some emotions out but I think I took so much from Dancing with the Stars as a person and I'm still very close to my partner and his wife to this day. The new cast just got announced and I'm so excited to watch it as a viewer this time. You've got a mirror ball trophy to your name. I mean, there's no one better to give advice. If you have any questions, message me. I would love, I could talk about it for hours and just have so much fun. We've seen a little bit, you know, obviously the trailer for season three is out. How do you find time for a relationship? What do you have that's just yours with um, the new man? <laughs> I think that there's a lot of stuff that I keep for myself. Landon and I are in a relationship in the public eye. There's a lot of pressure on You just want to be like me. You just want to be like me. Like he's hanging out with my dog back in LA right now. Like cute <laughs> things like that that no one else knows about but is really special to us and we just have so much fun together. When people do see us it's not like oh stay out of our relationship. It's like we're already together like everything's going great. Let's just be happy and like have fun. 
Has the D'Amelio family met his family? Yes, and I've texted them, and you know, dad to dad, uh -huh. it, it's just um, Travis. Will, his kids with me for weeks at a time, and my kids with him for weeks at a time. So we kind of have that bond, and and uh, and he knows that I'm looking after his son, and he's looking after my daughter. So that's yeah. Can't ask for much more than that. Nicest guy. How would you describe your relationship with social media? at this point in time. I really enjoy what I'm doing. Even just a, a group chat on like Twitter where we all just talk. Like they picked my nail color for this trip. It's like, it's those special kind of bonds that you have together with the people that, you know, are the reason you are where you are. How have you as parents navigated the role of social media in your family? It's strange being popular because of your kids because you, I've had this whole, my own identity my entire life, but I, I, that's actually the proudest thing is that to to bring up kids that have become so successful that they now have shed light on you that's the ultimate thing for a dad to experience so I, when people are like are you dixie and charlie's dad i'm like damn right i am yeah <laughs> I and mean, i'm proud of it i will say there is constantly people coming up to me and they're like oh my goodness your dad is so much fun <laughs> or like your parents are so cool i'm like Oh my gosh, I know. The shoe game is so strong. I mean, y'all walked in here and the whole room was like, oh my God. So D'Amelio footwear is something that I think everyone has been extremely excited for. Mm -hmm. I think the next few drops are by far like my favorites and I'm so excited to just live in them and have everyone else wear them. Okay, we have a little game for you guys. I am very proud of the title of this game. It's called fill in to blank. I love <laughs> If this doesn't win us the Pulitzer or the Emmy, That's I don't know what will. That's really good. I'll give you a couple prompts and you will fill in to blank. No cheating. The D'Amelio I'd want as my karaoke partner is blank. All right, one, two, three. Dixie Dixie Mark. <laughs> he can hit all the high notes. Yeah, he oh, does. I can. The D'Amelio I choose as a TikTok dance partner is... <laughs> One, two, three. Charlie, Charlie, Charlie. <laughs> yes. <laughs> if I was writing my... Along. I just, uh, I just close. Those dances are harder than dancing with the stars. <laughs> <laughs> um, the D'Amelio I'd call to bail me out of jail. One, two, three. Mark, Mark, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> this is also good to know. You've got everybody's you back. Know the call. All right, last one. The D'Amelio I trust with a secret. <laughs> one, two, three. <laughs> not Dixie, not Dixie, you or Heidi. Just because we forget. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm definitely You'll tell us in we one ear and out the other. Yeah. Dixie, yeah. Not Dixie. Is, is like common knowledge, like cannot keep she a secret. Cannot keep a secret. It's like mm. she'll tell me, like she'll be like, I have a secret, like I have, I'm keeping something from you. And then she's like, okay, I'm gonna tell you. I'm like I didn't even, <laughs> you I didn't right. even ask. ask. Like, it's your secret. Mm. <laughs> you guys, congratulations on season three, on the footwear line. I'm excited that you'll be able to watch Dancing with the Stars now, yeah. just with your feet up, yeah. popcorn yeah. out in your PJs. Yes. Um, thank you so much, D'Amelio thank family. You. Thanks for having me. All right, Will Gans, thank you. And the D'Amelio Show is streaming right now on Hulu. That is our show for this hour. I'm Trevor Alt. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks for streaming with us. Coming up in the next hour, thousands are still missing after deadly flooding in Libya. The most urgent needs as the nation tries to recover. And epic fight scenes and plenty of vengeance. How a series is expanding on stories from the wildly popular films, John Wick. Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Streaming free on ABC News Live. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now.
It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. Me. This is ABC News Live. The crushing of families Trump. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. It was the ideal marriage. Little did I know I was married to a man who had done something so horrible that it would devastate our lives forever. Teacher of the Year is now charged with sex crimes. Only on Hulu. He was living a double life. The shocking story behind a number one true crime podcast. Prostitutes. Escorts. He even cheated on me the week of our wedding. Betrayal, the perfect husband. He had a lot of fantasies. Now streaming only on Hulu. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You got to think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Good evening, everyone. This is ABC News Live Prime. I'm Trevor Alden for Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We have a lot of news to get to this evening, including another puzzling inmate escape. Authorities say this time a convicted child sex offender, last seen in this surveillance video, walked right out of a hospital in St. Louis while being treated. Plus, going inside the Continental, the new series that explores the origin behind a hotel for assassins straight out of the John Wick universe. And we meet the first disabled Latino woman who climbed Mount Kilimanjaro, who's empowering others to reach new heights. But we begin with a deadly bus crash roughly 75 miles north of New York City. A Greyhound bus filled with high school students tumbling off the road. Some 40 students were headed to a band camp in Pennsylvania when that bus veered off the road and down an embankment. Tonight we're learning at least two people are now dead, more than 40 are injured, and at least five students are in critical condition. Traffic on Interstate 84 was stopped in both directions for hours. As rescue teams pulled a ladder to the windows to try and rescue passengers. Passengers. Tonight, the investigation into what exactly went wrong is just getting underway, and Gio Benitez leads us off tonight from near the scene. First responders today racing to the scene of this horrific charter bus crash about 70 miles northwest of New York City. Just after 1 p.m., a coach bus carrying members of a high school marching band rolling over and down an embankment along Interstate 84 in Way Way Onda, New York. While it's preliminary, it is likely that a faulty front tire contributed to the accident, although, again, this is still under investigation. Bus rollover with ejection, 84 eastbound. The bus was one of six from Farmingdale High School on Long Island heading to a band camp in Greeley, Pennsylvania. We went on a school trip, and you end up on a bus on its side. Rescuers using a ladder to reach the injured and a rope to reach the crash site at the bottom of a ravine. 
Two adults were killed, more than 40 injured, at least five students in critical condition. Some had to be airlifted to nearby hospitals. I got chills, like, my, can't stop shaking, just worry about my friends. And, like, a lot of my friends are in the hospital. Our thanks to Gio. And next tonight to our nation's humanitarian crisis, the White House announcing some new measures to step up deportations at the border while also providing special status to hundreds of thousands of Venezuelans. ABC's Matt Rivers is in El Paso for us. Tonight, concern and desperation growing in cities across the southern border. Officials telling ABC News preliminary numbers show Border Patrol apprehended nearly 9,000 migrants at the border Wednesday, numbers not seen since the spring. It is a national issue and it should be dealt with as a national issue and not just simply your, your border communities. Overnight, the Biden administration announcing 800 active duty Department of Defense personnel now deploying to the border to expand migrant holding facilities and assist in deportations. The situation is dire and for some deadly. In Eagle Pass, Texas, where 2,500 migrants crossed on Wednesday, authorities today finding the body of a man in the Rio Grande River just hours after a three-year-old boy was swept away and killed. Here in El Paso, more than a thousand migrants are crossing every day on average, some forced to sleep in the streets. Gueris Gutierrez from Venezuela is stuck. He spent all his money on a journey north he wouldn't wish on anyone. He's basically saying like, you really got to think twice before making that journey. And amid this crisis, tonight, the Biden administration easing the process for some migrants to get work permits, extending temporary protected status to more than 470,000 Venezuelans arriving in the country before July 31st, allowing them to legally work, something New York City's mayor has been pushing for for months. That announcement was uh, well received by us. Uh, we could begin the process of allowing the seekers to become job seekers, from asylum seekers to job seekers. That's Matt Rivers reporting. And next, we turn to trouble on Capitol Hill as hardline Republicans have foiled Speaker Kevin McCarthy's efforts to fund the government and the military. And a government shutdown now looms just nine days away. They are also questioning the need for additional, additional funds for the war in Ukraine. President Biden and Zelensky are aggressively advocating for it, though. And here's ABC's senior national correspondent, Terry Moran. At a critical moment in the war, President Biden and First Lady Jill Biden welcoming the President and First Lady of Ukraine to the White House, publicly reaffirming their partnership. No nation can be truly secure in the world if, in fact, we don't stand up and defend the freedom of Ukraine uh, from the face of this Russian brutality and aggression. Biden promising more military aid. Significant air defense weapons, artillery ammunition, and more anti-armor systems. The price tag? Hundreds of millions of dollars. The Ukrainian leader expressed his deep gratitude, but he's also keenly aware that it's what happens up Pennsylvania Avenue at the Capitol that could decide his country's fate. I started my day in the U.S. Congress to thank his members and to people of America for all the big, huge support. I felt trust between us. But some House Republicans are drawing a hard line, refusing to budge on more money for Ukraine. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy had said he wanted, quote, accountability from Zelensky on how the money is being spent. Still after their meeting today, McCarthy sounding more supportive. Zelensky has answered a lot of questions for me. But the speaker is struggling to get his members on the same page. And Ukraine is just one sticking point. Today, in a stunning setback, McCarthy, for the second time, failed to muster enough Republican votes to move forward a major defense spending bill, something that typically just sails through. I had two people flip, so I got to figure out how to fix that. Did you know that they were going to flip before uh, the vote? No, that wasn't uh, the impression they had given. With a fragile four-vote majority, McCarthy is at the mercy of a handful of his far-right members. This is a whole new concept of individuals that just want to burn the whole place down. It, that doesn't work. 
The rebel Republicans are vowing to shut down the government in just nine days if they don't get their way on a host of issues, issuing this threat to any Republicans who would break ranks. Now, if we've got some of these moderate Republicans who want to go and join up with the Democrats, they will be signing their own political death warrant and they will be handing their, it to their exec executioner. So let's bring in Terry Moran now there outside Capitol Hill. Terry, want to focus on this potential government shutdown there now. Just nine days left to reach a deal. Of course, as we know, Congress has had far closer calls with a government shutdown. And it, certain, it seems like today that they're not going to stick around for the weekend to keep working. So what's the latest state of play here? Uh, no, Trevor, you're absolutely right. That is backtracking from Speaker McCarthy. He's canceling plans to hold votes over the weekend and essentially giving members a four-day weekend with just nine days to go before the government shuts down. That's Friday and the Yom Kippur holiday on Monday. That narrows the window to get that deal done. And really, there, there is deep dissatisfaction here, even in Republican-owned caucus, the Republicans-owned caucus, with some members saying they'll, they'll stick around and try to get something done. But right now... Wait till Tuesday. Yeah, if they stick around, nobody else there. Terry Moran for us. Terry, thank you. Next tonight, the hunt is on for a convicted child sex offender who escaped custody while being treated at Mercy Hospital in St. Louis. Tommy Wayne Boyd, who was serving 30 years in prison, was last seen on surveillance walking out just before 4 o'clock this morning. Police are warning he's dangerous. Here's ABC's Ariel Reshef. Tonight, a manhunt for convicted sex offender Tommy Wayne Boyd, seen here walking out of a St. Louis hospital early this morning, escaping custody despite being guarded by two corrections officers. 45-year-old Boyd is serving a 30-year sentence for enticement of a child. Authorities say he was transferred to the hospital Wednesday to receive treatment, last seen by staff at 3.54 a.m., traveling in an unknown direction, wearing a black sweatshirt, black jacket, and orange slippers. Drones searching overhead. Schools in the area placed on lockdown as police check vehicles in the hospital parking lot. Police writing on social media, we're urging residents to remain vigilant as our officers search for Mr. Boyd, adding, be sure your homes and garages are secure. Watch children at bus stops. If anybody sees this suspect, call 911, let us know his location, but do not approach the suspect. Trevor, multiple state and federal agencies had been searching for Boyd. Of course, this community now breathing a sigh of relief that he is back in custody. Trevor? All right, Ariel Resha for us. Ariel, thank you. And Rupert Murdoch today announced he is stepping down as chairman of Fox Corporation and News Corp, a sprawling media empire that includes Fox News and Wall Street Journal. At 92, he has been a mogul for decades, and he is, of course, no stranger to controversy. Here's ABC's Whit Johnson. Tonight, a monumental shift in the media world. Titan Rupert Murdoch stepping down as chairman of Fox and News Corporation, which run the Wall Street Journal, the New York Post, and Fox News. We have now some personal news to share with you this morning. Our boss, Rupert Murdoch, is transitioning from... The 92-year-old writing to his staff, the time is right for me to take on different roles, announcing his son, Lachlan Murdoch, will replace him as chair effective mid-November. Rupert Murdoch spent seven decades growing his multi-billion dollar media empire. Rupert Murdoch created all of this and so much more across America and the globe. The Murdoch dynasty believed to be the inspiration in part for the hit HBO series, Succession. This is not the end. I'm going to build something better. And no stranger to controversy, Fox recently settling a bombshell defamation lawsuit topping $787 million with Dominion Voting Systems after Fox News was accused of knowingly pushing false claims about voting machines in the 2020 election. On air, then Fox News host Tucker Carlson saying, You've heard a lot over the past few days about the security of our electronic voting machines. And this is a real issue. But in a text message, Carlson called claims about Dominion shockingly reckless. He was later dropped from the network. And Laura Ingram saying this. Disturbing irregularities have been found. But off air, she said Donald Trump's attorney, Sidney Powell, who is pressing the false claims, is a bit nuts. Sorry, but she is. And Rupert Murdoch himself later calling the conspiracies about the voting systems really crazy stuff and damaging. Murdoch started out with just a small Australian newspaper, expanding across continents to the UK and the US, eventually becoming a driving force in American conservative media. Each day I'm animated by a sense of purpose 
whatever I have achieved would simply not have been possible without the love of my family. And that's what Johnson reporting for us tonight. And we still have much more to get to coming up. A new perspective on the John Wick universe, how the Continental is telling the origin story of one of the series most popular characters. But next, preparing for the future, the major policies Australia is now reviewing to prepare for a possible health crisis. Whenever news breaks, the crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. NBC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. Here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Reporting from the White House, I'm Terry Moran. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. We're tracking several headlines around the world. In Libya, the International Committee of the Red Cross said sanitation and water access are the most urgent needs in Derna as humanitarian assistance is being deployed in the flood-hit African nation. Thousands are dead, thousands more are missing after Storm Daniel hit the eastern coast of Libya on September 10th. Australia's government said it would hold an independent inquiry into the handling of the COVID-19 pandemic to better prepare for future health crises. Australia closed its international borders and locked down cities, among other pandemic restrictions, and that helped keep infections and deaths far below levels in other comparable developed economies like the U.S. and Britain. It shifted to living with the virus in early 2022 after a majority of the population was vaccinated. And tears of joy in Brazil as indigenous groups erupted in celebrations after a majority of the Supreme Court voted against a cutoff date limiting indigenous land claims. Six of its 11 justices rejected that deadline on the grounds it was unconstitutional. The restriction was sought by the country's powerful farm lobby to block rights to land that indigenous people did not live on in 1988. And it's time tonight for the latest in our series, Streamline, where we take you behind some of the biggest film and TV series hitting screens worldwide. And of course, we have one from a gigantic cinematic universe that's expanding even further now, the John Wick universe. At the core of it is the Continental. It's a chain of international hotels that function as a neutral territory for high caliber criminals where assassination assignments can be safely exchanged. And if that doesn't sound riveting, I don't know how to get you hooked into it. It's a new three-part prequel series that's coming out called The Continental from the world of John Wick. It explores the origin behind the iconic hotel for assassins through the eyes and the actions of a younger version of the popular character Winston Scott as he attempts to seize control of that iconic hotel. Let's take a look. We have to strike first. And I need all the help I can get. How are we supposed to believe a guy in an ascot can pull this off? 
It's a cravat. That does look like Winston. Joining us now, <laughs> executive producer and director Albert Hughes. Thanks so much for being here. Oh, thanks for having me. I can't wait to see this. I'm a giant fan of the John Wick films, as so many people are. Mm. What drew you to it? I assume you were a fan first. Oh, yeah. I mean, I saw them all in the movie theaters. While we were making this, they were finishing four, and I saw an early cut, maybe almost close oh, to four hours. And I was a fan just because it, of what Chad Stahelski, the director, and Keanu had done. They'd taken all the influences of the past, Hong Kong cinema. Uh, Chad's a big uh, Bob Fosse musical fan, and he does a ballet of bullets. And it looks like these guys are having fun. So when it came to me, I go, we just got out of COVID. Everybody's kind of stressed out. Nobody wants to hear about reality right now. Right. I want to have fun. Maybe the audience wants to have fun, too. That's really interesting. And we mentioned this in the, in the intro. So the main character is Winston, who is known very well in the movies. This is a younger version of it. And uh, I, I believe that we have another clip here as he's trying to take control of the film. And he's also kind of running for his past. Can we play that clip from Winston? Winston, your brother stole something from me. took is very important to a lot of very dangerous people. Find him, because if you don't, I'll bring the weight of this whole institution down on you both. Sure. So Mel Gibson there also. Yeah. Uh, but I'm curious as a filmmaker, when you already have, number one, a character that exists in the world and is loved by fans, you need a younger version, so it's mm -hmm. got to be a different actor. How's that process and how complicated is that of finding the right person for the job? Well, it starts like the normal thing you do with any proce process in casting is that you put out a white search. But this guy, um, this actor, not this guy, he's a friend now, Colin Woodell, uh, he just has old throwback movie star qualities about his look and his relationship with the camera, but he's so smart as an actor for being so young. He's 31 years old. Oh, no kidding. And he just makes these fantastic choices. Uh, speaking of, you mentioned kind of... Uh having a little bit of a throwback feel. This is clearly set in the 70s. Mm -hmm. The soundtrack comes bursting at you just in the teaser there. Yeah. What role does the, the time play and how did you want to get that right? Well, I mean, it's easy. Uh, it the dec decade I was born in and, you know, there's a lot of nostalgia from Taxi Driver to Saturday Night Fever to disco to classic rock. Um, <laughs> and so it's this really crazy cool mix of music that rarely happens in cinema or TV. Um, and it, it's a reflection of New York, and New York is one of the singular cities where cultures mix like they do. You have no choice. You're going to hear and smell different foods and different ethnic backgrounds are there. So uh, that was cool about the 70s. It's cool now in New York. It's still the same as far as the cultures go, but right. in the 70s, there's just that special yeah. flair. Yeah. yeah. Well, it all sounds amazing, and the attention to the details there and from, I mean, just hearing that soundtrack also, they clearly invested in this and believe oh, yeah. in it too. So very excited for it. Albert, thank you for, uh, so much for coming here. Part one of The Continental from the world of John Wick. It premieres tomorrow on Peacock and then the rest of the series installments premiering on September 29th and October 6th. Albert, thanks so much for being here. Thank you so much. Wonderful to meet you. And still to come, Marseille Marignon tells us how she broke some barriers for women with disabilities on Mount Kilimanjaro and how she's creating a community to inspire the next generation in this week's TikTok. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. From America's number one news comes the all new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. All right, here we go, you ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is what would you do? Let's go. How are you? 
So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. We turn now to our weekly segment, Tick Talk, where we take a closer look at the story behind the sensation. And as we continue celebrating and honoring Hispanic Heritage Month, we're highlighting creators who are breaking boundaries, impacting their community, and inspiring others. And our next trailblazer is doing just that, Marcela Marignon. She is the first disabled Latino woman to climb Mount Kilimanjaro. She is best known on the app as the journey of a brave woman. And she's inspiring the next generation of women with disabilities to push forward and go after their dreams. Marcela, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for being here. How are you? Thank you so much for having me. Uh, you have a remarkable story, and it's been amazing watching you share it with the world here. Take us through, for people who don't know you, what that journey's been like for you, beginning with uh, what happened when you were 20 years old and how it changed your life. Yes, when I was 20 years old, I was involved in a car accident that left me paralyzed and, and above the knee amputee. And so this month is, uh, is going to be 21 years Unbelievable what you've been able to accomplish since then. I mean, climbing Mount Kilimanjaro, we're talking about more than 19,000 feet up, and you were able to accomplish that. What was that like? Okay, so it was a wonderful experience, and I still cannot process what I have done, because we're talking about <laughs> Mount Kilimanjaro, the, one of the tallest mountains of Africa. So um, I think that um, this is an accomplishment that I have achieved for every single disabled uh, person, like for my community, to show them that, you know, anything is possible. And we know that you've been inspiring all kinds of people, and you've been traveling all over the world, really, promoting accessibility, promoting equality. I know it's a passion project for you. I believe you spent some time in Tanzania. What did you do there? Yes, I was there in May. I went to meet wonderful children. So we have 80 children in the program that need uh, medical care after uh, surgeries. Also, they need to have a community and a, a educational program where they can learn about their disabilities. So I am working on this project called the House of Hope Project, where I can give this to these kids so they can have a community and they cannot be excluded from their villages. And how were your experiences personally getting to meet some of those kids? It was, for me, it was incredible, but I was like, what else I can do to help them? Because I know that they're struggling. I have seen very bad cases when I was there. And I travel to see, to inform myself, to make sure that this is, this is true. And when I was there, I was like, okay, so, I am so privileged to live in a country where I can have everything. And when I see these little kids struggling, not having what I have, it broke my heart. So this is why I am so passionate about this project and I want to make it happen. And you're very clearly working hard to help out more than people, uh, more than just yourself. You're trying to help people all over the world. Uh, you talk about some of the things that you've been able to have uh, participated in medically. I know that in 2014, you were part of some innovation that was designed to help people with spinal cord injuries, maybe stand up, take some steps, climb some stairs. How's that journey going? Yes, um, I was one of the Rewalk ambassadors, and I have been traveling with the company, and I'm okay for the technology to be accepted and welcomed into the clinic uh, facilities, so other people with spinal cord injuries can walk again. So, and right now I'm working with other their company, so I am very happy to promote that because it's not about walking, it's about what things that we can do to don't get more ill. So I truly believe in that technology and it's helping me and I know that it's helping so many people as well. I mean, at this point, it seems kind of like you're unstoppable and you can do whatever you're putting your mind to. So what are you putting your mind to? What's next for you? Okay, so what's next for me is to make the House of Project possible. I really want to work on that. I want to make it possible. I want to help improve the life of those children. So this is why I have, you know, uh, created a fundraising page where, you know, that uh, if people want to donate, they can help me make that project um, 
possible. So the link is in the Journey of a Brave Woman social media. And uh, yeah, and then maybe travel in um, the world and show what is accessible or not and um, make a difference for the disabled community. Well, I think a lot of people are going to see this and be inspired to check it out. And you've already been inspiring so many people. Marcela, thanks so much for joining us. Remember, you can follow Marcela's journey on TikTok at The Journey of a Brave Woman. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you so much. Of course. And that is our show for tonight. I'm Trevor Alt. ABC News Live is here for you all night with the latest news, context, and analysis. And you can always find us on Hulu, Roku, the ABC News app, and of course on abcnews.com. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You got to think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. It was the ideal marriage. Little did I know I was married to a man who had done something so horrible that it would devastate our lives forever. Teacher of the Year is now charged with sex crimes. Only on Hulu. He was living a double life. The shocking story behind a number one true crime podcast. Prostitutes. Escorts. He even cheated on me the week of our wedding. Betrayal, the perfect husband. He had a lot of fantasies. Now streaming only on Hulu. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Reporting from Manhattan, I'm Diane Macedo. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. This is Nightline. It's huge. It's dirty. It's loud. Coursing through the middle of one of America's most iconic cities. It's always been known as the monster. A concrete giant looms overhead. People they call it the monster. Why? Look at it. It's ugly, it's obnoxious, and it ate up that neighborhood. Interstate I-10, known as the Claiborne Corridor, cuts through the historic Tremaine neighborhood of New Orleans, the birthplace of jazz. It's one of the most notorious highways in America. It killed the center of the black community. Conceived as a vital passageway to move people and goods across the city, it also left behind a toxic environmental legacy for generations to endure. More than 49 million Americans live within a mile of a highway where traffic pollution may contribute to startling health risk, including elevated risk of cancer and lung disease 
according to an ABC News data analysis done in collaboration with our own stations. Residents living within 10 miles of Interstate 880 have, on average, twice the cancer risk and are almost twice as likely to develop respiratory illnesses. We are sacrifice zones. Our communities apparently can be sacrificed for an economic good that does not benefit our neighborhood. But now, calls for change across the country. We're here to announce a first-of-its-kind initiative to help cities and towns to deliver a transportation future and the struggle to find solutions at the community level. The amount of tentacles that's attached to this is mind-blowing. I love Treme. I love Treme. For nearly her entire life, Amy Stelly has lived beside the Claiborne Corridor. I really loved growing up in my house. I'm the third generation to live in the house, so we have a long history of residency in Treme. My house is a block and a half from the elevated deck and a half block from the Orleans Avenue ramp. You can see it. I can see it all day, every day. You can smell it. Yes, all day, every day. The emissions cause all kinds of respiratory ailments. And my house doesn't have air conditioning, so in the summertime, I sleep with my windows open. And the monster gets in. The monster comes in. Yeah. Right. A self-described freeway fighter. The first thing I notice is it's awfully loud down here. It's very loud. Amy has long waged war on the highway outside her door. The Claiborne Expressway is the poster child for urban highways that need to be removed. The highway just destroyed a, a key artery in the neighborhood, a key place. By the 1950s, highways were being built across America, establishing vital trade routes and connecting booming suburbia with the nation's business centers downtown. In New Orleans, urban planners began to envision two expressways, one along the river cutting through the famed French Quarter and another through Treme, one of the oldest African-American communities in the country. White business merchants and lawyers were able to stop the highway plan for the French Quarter, but things went differently on Claiborne. And when you move over to Claiborne Street, which is African-American, mostly poor, there was no conversation. So we just woke up one morning and there were the bulldozers. Historian and lifelong Treme resident Raynard Sanders has spent years researching what Claiborne Avenue was like before the highway ran through it. This was the cultural and commercial hub for the Treme community. And at one point, there was registered about 120 businesses. 120? In this, yeah, in this 22 block area. And of course, bars and music. So all of the early jazz musicians that created what we love today come from the Treme community, and they played on Claiborne Street. And at the heart of it all, a towering canopy of oak trees that stretched as far as the eye could see. This is Claiborne Avenue here, and it's the only neutral ground that had four rows of oak trees. But then construction began. 200 oak trees, they just start tearing them down. At first glance, it looked like it was bombed out on them. Yes. <laughs> oak trees replaced with concrete columns, business and homes reduced to empty lots. It came straight up Claiborne Street like a quarterback running up the center of the field. And it was like, if you get in the way, you will die. Fred Johnson was an eyewitness to the destruction. What did you think at the time? I didn't know what the hell was going on. All of a sudden, these bulldozers showed up, and the trees started coming up. It was horrible, sinful, shameful. The highway keeps it grimy. It remains in disrepair. Nobody wants to invest in it. After living in the shadow of the highway most of her life, Amy created the Claiborne Avenue Alliance, a nonprofit with one aim in mind. I want the highway removed. Gone. Gone. There's no in between for me. But if they get rid of it, what, what replaces it? Because it's still a major uh, thoroughfare that people get in and out of New Orleans. In. That was the purpose of highways, right? To get people in and out as quickly as possible. Yes, that was the purpose, without the regard for the people who live near it. I understand that we need to transport people, but you have to do it putting people first, not only the people in cars, but the people who live near those arteries. Amy also began working with environmental scientists. The reason we're here today is we're going to be doing some basic monitoring of the environment. Like LSU's Dr. Adrian Kattner. 
who organizes pollution monitoring field trips near the highway with local science students. All of those cars deposit particulate matter on us. I live down the street. We went with them last year. During these field trips, students measure air and soil pollution in a park located directly by the expressway. Everybody breathing this air, a dangerous thing, because the numbers keep going up. And I was at seven. As they approach the highway, the numbers start going up. It makes me worry about the people that are down here. But it's sad, though, because people have to, like, breathe this in every day yeah. because they live so close to it. Data points echo by the findings of an ABC News analysis showing Treme residents living within a mile of the I-10 corridor face higher risk of cancer and asthma well above national averages. Although many factors contribute to higher than average health problems, experts say traffic pollution is a known health hazard. For many here, the only solution to this stretch of I-10 known as the monster is to kill it, destroy it, tear it down. But the reality is, to tear this down would cause a new set of issues. You just can't up and move that highway. You have to make certain that there's a safety net for the people that has fought, bled, and died and paid dues there. Like many here, Fred fears removing the highway would gentrify the neighborhood and lead to tax increases, pushing out Treme's longtime residents. However much I don't like it, I have to understand it's kind of a quagmire hmm. because certain things have to be done to make certain that folks don't get displaced all over again. If the highway goes away, there are some that are concerned that the neighborhood will become gentrified. Right. Well, it is of great fear and a valid fear, so I refuse to see us as damned if you do and damned if you don't. In 2021, Amy's cause got a shot in the arm from President Biden when he announced the American Jobs Plan would provide funding to reconnect neighborhoods divided by highways. It's not a plan that tinkers around the edges. The White House even listed Claiborne by name in the plan's outlines, a prime example of infrastructure that divided communities. Biden proposed $20 billion to tackle the issue nationwide, but ultimately only about $4 billion was allocated over a five-year period after the new program was combined with another. Is there enough money to get this done? The math doesn't quite say. Right. So uh, freeway fighters across the country were upset at the reduction in the budget. It's nowhere near enough to take these things down. Amy's nonprofit submitted an application to the program anyway, asking for a grant to study the Claiborne Avenue Expressway and reimagine the area without it. Ultimately, the U.S. Department of Transportation chose not to fund Amy's plan. Instead, they offered a $500,000 planning grant towards a $100 million Louisiana state proposal that keeps the highway largely intact but provides better maintenance as well as a public market and performance space under 